Hi, continuing with Cubs and Culture for January 19th, 2018, continuing our exploration of La La Land. Um, I want, oh, okay, so there will be spoilers, spoilers, spoilers. Um, uh, just to give you a brief sense of the movie, it's a romantic, um, it's a love story in which uh, the two characters are both sort of dreamers and to order to come down from uh, their ideals and professionally... They have to um, compromise, and they end up... T- so, that basically, it's a tension between uh, sort of their idealized... B- being a dreamer in terms of their love life or being a dreamer in terms of their profession. Uh, Sebastian, who's the male uh, lead, um, played by Ryan Gosling, and wants to be a, uh, uh, be true to sort of his ideals and being a jazz, and Mia, who's played by Emma Stone... Um, wants to be an actress, and the movie ultimately is about um, sort of in a conversation while telling this love story uh, about what you need to do, um, how much of, excuse the pun, but La La Land, you know, not being connected to reality, being as much of a dreamer as you can be, how much are you willing to compromise to order to be successfully? Successful, both personally and professionally. And let me just tell, uh, say this up front. I actually think this movie, they, because they don't end up together, they end up both choosing sort of their professional ideal over their personal ideal of each other. Um, which in some ways is very, very, like, it, like one of the reasons why I like this movie as much as I do, um, is it settles on, like, it's both a sort of a happy love story, sort of like a, sort of a happy love story in that both characters end up being um, uh, professionally satisfied. And it's also sort of a sad love story in that they don't end up together. It's a really good movie to talk about the difference between happiness and pleasure, which I'll do in a moment. Um, but anyway, so that's to set the stage. It's um, dire- um, written and directed by Damien Chazanel. Uh, I'm probably butchering his last name. This is the same man who made Whiplash, and one of the things I like about La La Land, and I don't haven't seen that much commentary about that, but it's actually sort of in conversation with Whiplash because Whiplash was um, all about uncompromising, um, pushing yourself uh, to suffer for your art and being uncompromised, uncompromising towards your ideals, whereas La La Land is talking about. Um, if you want to be successful professionally or personally, how do you balance things? Um, and the other thing is, it's very uh, uh, like on um, Whiplash, it comes across as a very personal sort of story. Uh, Chesnel, again, I'm probably butchering his name. Um, quite clearly, <laughs> he modeled Sebastian, at least his love of jazz, and sort of his uncompromising about what true jazz is after some of his own thoughts. And likewise, I kind of get the sense that. Uh, Chazelle is actually a very young director. This is only his second movie, though based off of Whiplash in this movie, he's probably going to have a great career. Um, that you kind of also get the sense that Emma Stone's, um, Mia's character is also sort of modeled on his desire to make it in the movies. Um, in some ways you can almost see this story as a very personal sort of psychological drama between... Chazelle's like desire to be a musician and his desire to be a filmmaker and how he can't be both uh, or he can be both. It's very, very interesting on that sort of way that he clearly modeled Sebastian on him. And at least as far as Mia wanting to be in show business, that clearly also reflects him to some degree. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So, so let me pause for a moment. And because it's this very sort of personal story it's very well written and it's you get you um you get sort of contradictions when the characters you get sort of the um uh, uh, 360 degrees you don't always get but the thing i really like about the screenplay which just to be clear um i think whiplash shows off chazelle's abilities as a writer more than a director, and I think La La Land shows off his abilities as a director more than a writer, is he does a really good job of 
balancing sort of the realness of the relationship again, because ultimately the conclusion of this film is a very realistic, you have to grow up. You can't hold on to your ideals. Um, with the, so the, so there's, so, so like there's a scene in which they're fight, it's the fighting scene where they're fighting about, you know, did you come, because he joins a band to try to support her so she can pursue her own dream, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and they have this fight and it's very, the way in which the scene plays out is incredibly realistic in that it begins with sort of a nice romantic gesture and then it's just, she mentions, oh, do you like how you, uh, do you like what you're playing now? And it spirals out of control and it feels very, very real. It feels, um, <laughs> like it feels like a conversation that actually Chanel actually probably had at one point and, um, um, or at least you can imagine it. it feels very, very authentic in that way. And that's balanced very out of uh, balanced very well with the lyrics of city, you know, the way in which the, the music itself is very la la land. Like it's very, very much, very much the ideal, the, um, going after the beauty perfection. So there's this great tension in the entire, um, screenplay between, uh, it's, your idealized fantasy, how you want your life to go and then how your life is actually going and what aspects of your dream do you want to hold on to? Because in the way in which their personalities work and how their professions work, they can't hold on to both them, each other and their professional life. Um, so it ends up being incredibly believable and incredible moving and involving. Um, but it's also sort of a great companion piece to Whiplash because Whiplash is also sort of talking about how you have to, um, uh, if you're uncompromising in to suffer for your art, what the cost of that is. Uh, okay, so I mentioned the difference between human flourishing and human um, pleasure. So, or happiness is a weird word. Happiness can mean uh, either, you know, I feel happy, like sort of like, I, I excuse the pitched example, but I do, like if I do a um, little bit of cocaine, like, not that I've done cocaine, but just use it as an example, but, or heroin, you know, I get high, like, that's pleasure. But if you get high all the time, and all you ever do is get high, you're not living a very, you're not living a very rich life, okay? So, in Greek, um, the word we tra on translate, um, for happiness in Greek actually means closer to something like human, human flourishing, where, um, it's not feeling happy all the time, but it's in the, that you're doing, that in some ways you're hitting the mark or living a life that is, uh, where you're in some ways you're satisfied, you're, you're satisfied with sort of the compromises you have to make. Or to use another sort of example, um, of uh, you have like Harry and Harold, Harold, um, thinks his wife loves him. He has a great job and he thinks his wife loves him and everything like that. Um, but he, his wife wants to kill him. And so she, every single day, it's sort of a tension for him to, um, for her not to poison him via his coffee. And then for Harry, um, you have, you know, a guy who's struggling and he has a girlfriend and he fights with all, uh, sometimes, but generally speaking, everything is honest and, you know, it's not always the best, but overall it makes, he feels satisfied with his life. Um, whereas Harold thinks he's happy, but he's really not because it's false. Um, so that's sort of, but he has the pleasure of feeling that he's happy. So that's sort of the distinction I'm trying to work with. Um, and I think La La Land, one of the reasons why I really, really like this film is it really does settle on sort of a, uh, 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 because a lot of times in movies, especially like romantic love stories, um, things are either always completely tragic, as like in Romeo and Juliet, where both leads die, or it's very, very fairy tale and it ends up being everything's a hundred percent, um, um, uh, good and uh, correct. So, um, like Disney movies, um, and they lived happily ever after. The way in which both characters sort of like so at the end, there's this um, music, there's a fantasy musical sequence which shows sort of an alternate um, reality for them, which they end up together 
but they don't have their professional careers. So, uh, so because she wants to be an actress, it's sort of implied that when her big break comes, she begins a romantic relationship with a um, casting agent, though I don't, that might just be me. But in any case, at the end, he has his jazz club and she has her acting career, but they're not together. And there's this fantasy sequence where they're together, but they don't have those two careers. Um, and so, because of the way in which the movie pits personal and professional life, the idea, those two ideals against each other, like, it ends up, I feel like, at the end of the movie, both characters are happy, but they're also not happy, like, they're happy overall in their life, but seeing each other wasn't pleasant. And it feels much more like they're flourishing in the, um, sort of the Greek endomimina sense, as opposed to being happy in the English sense. And so, like, it's one of the few love stories I've ever seen where it doesn't, where it ends up, because and it's all believable, all well-crafted, all fits together correctly, where they end up, in some sense, uh, like, happy but apart, as opposed to, or, um, like, it's both, like, it's it's both a happy ending and a tragic ending. And it's, again... It's that's really hard to do, and I haven't seen it often. So, in terms of like the story, it hits a nice sweet spot, and it's um, good, um, and it has sort of layers of depth. Okay, I'm gonna I'm rambling now, so I'll see you in a bit talking about direction.